Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be looking at the basics of Greek nouns. And in particular, we're going to be looking at something called the nominative case. There are a few key ideas that we need to get a hold of when we're learning about Greek nouns. One is the idea of case. We also need to learn the anatomy of a Greek noun, and that in involves three components, the stem, the connecting vowel, and the case ending. We'll learn about those, and the idea of a declension. So, first of all, what is a noun's case? This isn't a familiar idea for English speakers, but we can think of case in the sense of a job, an assignment. So a word is on the case. It's on a particular case, playing a particular role. Case is the job that a noun does in a clause. How does it modify the other words? Is it the subject of the sentence? Is it the uh, object of the verb? How does it contribute to the overall idea of the clause? And nouns take different forms when they are playing uh, different cases, when they're playing different roles. And we can think of this sort of like uniforms for different jobs. These nouns take different uniforms, and usually this is in the form of a different ending. We have the same noun, but the last couple of letters drop off and are replaced by different letters depending on the case, the, the job, that the noun is playing in the sentence. Occasionally, we also see the actual stem, the, the core part of the noun, change slightly depending on its case, and we'll talk about that more. Do we have noun cases in English? Well, English does have cases in the sense that nouns play different roles. Subject, possessive pronouns, direct object, indirect object, etc. But English no longer uses different word forms to indicate case. Instead, the same form of the word can be subject, as in the ball flew. It can be direct object, she caught the ball. Or it can be the indirect object of the verb, he swung at the ball. In none of these cases does the form of the word change, even though its case, the role it's playing in the sentence, does change. Why not? Well, because case and case endings have been replaced in English by word order and prepositions. The only place in English where some case uniforms or distinct word forms for different cases, the only place where these have survived in English is in personal pronouns. And in this case, Unlike in Greek, it's not just the ending of the word that changes, it's the whole word that changes depending on the case. So if we take, for example, the first person personal pronoun, if it is acting as the subject in the sentence, it takes the form I. If it's acting as the direct object, it takes the form me. Uh, if it's acting as the subject and it's plural, we say we, and if it's the direct object and it's plural, we say us. So you see, this is really the same word in both cases, I and me, we and us, but it takes different forms depending on what role it plays in the, sen uh, in the sentence. In the second person personal pronoun, in modern English, we only use the same uh, form throughout, you. But uh, if you think about Shakespearean English, or old-fashioned English, the King James Bible, you'll remember that we used to have different case forms for the second person singular. If it was the subject of the sentence, we would say thou, and if it were the direct object, we would say thee. Um, in the third person singular, we again come back to, in modern English, to using different uh, forms of the word depending on what role it's playing in the sentence. So if it's masculine, the subject we say he, direct object we say him. If it's feminine, she and her. If it's uh, neuter, we say it and it. So we use the same 
uh, form for subject and direct object if we're talking about uh, something that's inanimate, an object. But in the masculine and feminine forms, we do again use different forms of the word depending on the role it's playing in the sentence. Okay, so how does Greek handle this? Why does Greek use different case forms in the first place? Well, because English can use word order to show what job a word is playing, where uh, different word orders convey different meaning. So the girl fed the dog means something different than the dog fed the girl. In the first case, we imagine a normal situation of a girl filling up the dog's bowl. In the second situation, we're wondering uh, what exactly the girl is eating and, and why the dog is feeding her. The only difference is the order in which we've placed the words. But because of that order, we know that the subject of the sentence comes first before the verb and that the object of the verb follows it. And so we can tell who's doing the feeding just from that word order. In fact, some word orders don't even make sense. So if I said fed the dog the girl, um, it's not just that that would be strange, but it wouldn't make sense in English. Well, Greek is different. In Greek, word order doesn't tell us much at all. And you can re rearrange the words in most sentences without changing the idea. So in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse uh, 1, we're told, Theos ein halagos, that the word was God. But we could equally well rearrange those words and say, halagos ein theos, and the meaning of the sentence wouldn't change. We could also say, ein halagos theos, and the meaning of the sentence still wouldn't change. Because word order is so fluid and doesn't carry much meaning in Greek, you need some other signals to tell a speaker and a reader and a listener what role each word is playing in the sentence. And so Greek uses different case uniforms, different case endings. Greek nouns then have three parts. The stem conveys the word's basic meaning. And this doesn't usually change very much from one case to the next. In the case of the word logos, log here is the stem of the word. Then we have a case ending that signals the word's role in the clause. And here the S, the sigma, is the case ending for the nominative case. In other words, playing the role of the subject in the sentence. And thirdly, we need something to connect the stem with the case ending, and most of the time we have a connecting vowel. In this case, it's Omicron. So when we put those together, we get the word logos. But it's just the log stem that really carries the basic idea of the word. In this case, logos means word. The sigma at the end tells us that this is a word that's the subject of the sentence, it's in the nominative case, and the omicron here connects that sigma to the stem of the word. We can think of the connecting vowel as the glue holding the case ending onto the stem. Now I also said that we would be introduced here to the idea of noun declensions, and if uh, the new ideas are starting to pile up here, don't worry too much because we're going to be using these ideas and practicing them quite a bit. But there are uh, three big declensions of nouns in, uh, in Greek, and a declension is a big family of nouns. We have the first declension, and Adelphi is an example. The second declension, and Logos, is a word that belongs to that family of words. And pater is a word that belongs to the third family of words, the third declension. Each declension shares some basic traits. And primarily, that is two things. First of all, each declension uh, 
uses the same connecting vowel. So in the first declension, first declension words will usually use an eta or an alpha to glue that case ending onto the stem of the word. Uh, in the second declension, we usually have an omicron gluing that case ending onto the stem of the word. And in the third declension, we usually don't have any connecting vowel, and we'll see uh, how that works later. The other thing that uh, is shared by members of each declension is their case endings. So we saw before that a sigma on the end uh, of logos meant that that word was the uh, subject of the sentence. But if we're dealing with a word from the first declension, that family of words, uh, a sigma on the end means uh, something slightly different. And here you'll see that with pater from the third declension, um, when it's playing the role of the subject of the sentence, it doesn't have any ending at all. That's in fact how you recognize that it's the uh, playing the role of the subject. Let's look then at the forms that words actually take in the nominative case. And again, the nominative case is the, the case, the job, of being the subject of the verb in the clause. How do we recognize that a word is in the nominative case? By its nominative case ending. And you might already recognize these case forms uh, because the nominative case is often used as the dictionary form of a noun. Here's a chart of the basic nominative case endings, and you'll want to remember this. Um, this chart may take a little bit of explaining, but hang in there because we're going to see similar charts uh, in the future. First of all, this box over here, you'll see, gives us the uh, nominative case endings for third declension nouns. That's that third family. Uh, this box in the middle here, on the left-hand side, gives us the case ending for first declension nouns, the first family of uh, words, and then the box above it and below it uh, both belong to the second declension. So second declension nouns can actually use two different letters as their nominative case ending, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Because uh, declension is somewhat related to the gender of the noun. With the first and second declension, generally, masculine and neuter words are second declension, and feminine words are first declension. There are some exceptions to that, but uh, generally that's the case. And the masculine and neuter uh, words in the second declension, although they have, uh, in some cases, different uh, case endings, much of the time their case endings are the same, and even more important, they share the same connecting vowel. That's why we include them in the same family, uh, even though they're different genders and they're uh, using different nominative case endings. Uh, the first declension, though, uses its own connecting vowel. We saw it was eta or alpha before. When we get to the third declension, though, that relationship between declension and gender breaks down. And where feminine words are going to be first declension uh, as opposed to second declension, they can also be third declension, but so can neuter words and so can masculine words. So the third declension, the third family, is kind of a catch-all, uh, and we find words in that family from any gender. So if we have a masculine word that's in the second declension, and it's playing the role of the subject of the sentence, it's going to end in a sigma. Uh, a first declension feminine word won't have any uh, letter on the end at all in the nominative case. Uh, the neuter second declension word, if it's uh, being the subject of the sentence, will end in a new. And if we go over to third declension nouns, uh, when they're being the subject of the sentence, uh, they'll either end in a sigma 
or like the uh, first declension feminine words, they won't have any ending at all. Now that may all seem a little bit theoretical, but it's important to remember this chart. Sigma, nothing, new, and then third declension, sigma or nothing. When we combine those endings with the connecting vel for each uh, declension, we get uh, what looks like this. So the Omicron connecting vel in the second declension, masculine and neuter, uh, gives us the forms os and on that are going to, going to go on the stem of the noun. Because there's actually no uh, final consonant, final uh, case ending in the nominative, uh, first declension feminine nouns just end with their connecting vowel, either eta or alpha. And here in the third declension, third declension words in the nominative don't have a connecting vowel, so either we get just the stem with nothing added onto it, or we get the stem with a sigma added right onto the stem. Let's see what this actually looks like on some words. The word logos is a masculine word, it's masculine in gender, and it's second declension. So we have the, the stem log, and then if it's the subject of the verb, we uh, add os after that stem log. Uh, also in the second declension, if a word is neuter, like technon, we have the stem, techn, we have that same omicron connecting vowel, and now if you remember, we have a nun instead of the, or sorry, a nu instead of the uh, sigma. So we have the form technon. Os uh, for masculine second declension words and on for neuter second declension words. Um, Pidiske is a, a feminine first declension word that uses eta as its connecting vowel. And thura, which means door, is a first declension feminine noun that uses alpha as its uh, connecting vowel. And so in the uh, nominative case, we just have, again, uh, the stem with that connecting vowel and nothing else, no case ending. For the third declension, um, the word pais, child, ends, as you can see, with sigma, like the second declension masculine. Uh, ichthus, which means fish, also ends with sigma, but you'll see there's no connecting vowel. That, they butt right up against the stem of the word. And then a word like mater, mother, has no uh, nominative ending at all. What are the implications of all of this? Well, there are some implications for how we read English translations what we can and can't tell from a translation. Because word order is often very different in Greek than it is in English. Um, in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Greek says theos ein halogos, but the English consistently translates that the word was God. Why? Because in English, the word order is restricted. If we said God was the word, it would mean something different. But there is some significance in the Greek word order because it's often used for emphasis. The idea doesn't change, but the, the emphasis and so some of the implications can change. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, because theos comes first in the Greek clause, there seems to be some stress on the fact that the word is God. The significance is the deity of the word. Well, that's something that doesn't come through in English. And that's only possible, that kind of uh, nuance of emphasis is only possible because Greek can use word order like that to provide emphasis. And Greek can only use word order to provide emphasis because it has other ways of showing us what role, what case a noun is playing in the sentence. And you can see here in John 1.1, uh, theos, it's that second declension masculine uh, nominative ending. So that shows us that, that uh, theos and logos are in the same declension. 
the same family of words, that second declension, and they're both masculine in gender. We can tell that too because of that os ending. Um, and we can see that they're both also uh, playing the role of the subject of the sentence. Now that may seem a little bit odd, but we're going to explain how that works when we talk about verbless clauses in a little while. You can learn more about Greek cases and the nominative case in particular in Mounts's Basics of Biblical Greek, third edition, and I provide the page numbers and section numbers there. Just be aware that Mounts introduces two cases to together, the nominative and the accusative. Well, we're starting just with the nominative. Don't worry yet about the sections that deal with the accusative case. We'll get to those in a few weeks.